This is a special MiamiSprings.com interview with Manny Diaz Jr., candidate for Florida State Senate. This video is brought to you in part by Ceviches by Divino, located right in the heart of Miami Springs on Curtis Parkway, next to Starbucks. Enjoy fresh ceviches and Peruvian food at Ceviches by Divino in Miami Springs. Thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us uh, with MiamiSprings.com. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Manny, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what are you running for here in the state of Florida? So I'm actually a uh, product of Miami Springs Senior High School. I'm a Golden Hawk class of 1990. I uh, grew up in uh, Southeast Hialeah. Born and raised and, uh, and went to school at Miami Springs back then junior high uh, and then Miami Springs senior high and uh, went on to college, uh, played baseball for the Golden Hawks and went on to college to play uh, college baseball. And then I actually returned to Miami Springs to the alma mater and uh, I was uh, I taught there for social studies for one year and coached baseball before I transferred on to middle school in, uh, in Hialeah. Okay. What school did you teach in Hialeah? I, went, I taught at uh, Hialeah Miami Lake Senior High. We still love you here, Miami Springs. Yeah, I hope so. so. I hope so. Yeah, the Golden Hawks. Um, what, where did you go when you left here? Where did you go to school? I went to St. Thomas University, where I played baseball for four years. Oh, right. And then uh, I went on. Once I started teaching, went out to Nova Southeastern to get my uh, master's. Okay. And then, and what are you doing now? So I'm now the chief operating officer of a private nonprofit college that uh, specializes in both dual enrollment and also leadership development for uh, prospective assistant principals and principals, uh, and really staying in the education arena, but kind of from a different uh, perspective. Perfect. And you've been representative. Uh, in state, re state representative, uh, representing the 103rd district, which is uh, encompasses parts of Hialeah, Hialeah Gardens, Medley is actually in the district. Uh, and, uh, and Miami Dakes, so uh, western portions of Miami Dakes County. And uh, I've been up there for six years. Uh, and you're ready for state senate? I'm ready for the state senate. This is uh, state senate district 36, which is uh, it covers Miami Springs. Uh, currently held by uh, Senator Rodney Garcia, who's termed out, and, uh, so it's an open seat. And it's uh, it's really uh, it's, it's really been a joy for me to be able to come back to the eastern portion of Miami, and especially to Miami Springs, where I have it. You know, um, I actually was a business owner here a while back. I used to have a two-room center right here on the circle. Right. So it's always great to come back to my roots and uh, be able to see people that I went to school with. And it's awesome. Beautiful. Uh, tell us, you know, what got you into politics in the first place? So you know, it's, I think it's in the blood. My my, uh, my dad, my parents were always active. And, when I was a kid in local politics and uh, going back to my roots in Cuba, my grandfather was active and, and, I, and I really got involved because uh, I saw what was going on with our schools it concerned me as a 20 year educator within the public schools, teacher, um, assistant principal, coach uh, and, and, it, and I, wanted to, I wanted to do something so I started getting involved behind the scenes first and then one day I woke up and I said uh, you know I'm going to run for school board which you know, going back was a great experience, but we were, we were not successful in 2010 with that one. But it re we really did learn a lot about what it takes to, to, to run a campaign and how important it is to communicate with voters and, and get a feel for what's going on in the community. Okay. And what got you interested in running for the state senate? So my time in the House, um, we've really been able to have an effect, uh, not just statewide policy, but on our local community, you know, the, seeing the, the needs uh, for infrastructure, drainage, senior meals, taking care of our elderly population, really making sure that we fund GBP and that we get our, our kids, no matter what uh, social economic background they have, have an opportunity to have a head start in life. And then obviously, uh, my passion, which is making sure that all kids regardless of where they live, have the opportunity to go to high quality school. And that includes our, our students with disabilities that have a real passion for, for uh, feeling, you know, helping students with autism, uh, both while they're in school and, and even, you know, post school. A lot of people forget uh, that some of these kids leave school when they're 22, but then they still have some needs that they need to, to, to be able to function uh, within our society. And sometimes people forget, you know, uh, when they get a little older. So it's real passion. I work with the uh, UM uh, and NSU Card Center. Uh, they have a presence in Miami Lakes. Uh, they have a presence at the University of Miami and at NOVA. So that's that's one of my passions is those students with disability. It helps that my wife was a, uh, a special education teacher as well. And for a lot of my years in this public school system as an administrator, I oversaw uh, special education and saw some real stories that, that, that really tug at your heartstrings. And so um, I always find that, look, there's people that can fend for themselves in here. I'm here to serve everybody, but there's there's just some particular cases that really get your attention.
attention and like, make you feel like, hey, I gotta get back. Uh, if you do become stay center, what are some of your top goals that you'd like to accomplish? Listen, I think the number one thing that I have learned from the people that I've been visiting throughout the district is everybody's concerned about taxes and property values and all that, and especially in South Florida. I think what happens is a lot of older folks who have worked their entire life who lived the American dream, right? They worked for 30, 40 years, paid off their home, and now are living on fixed incomes, are concerned that the taxes are going to get them priced out of their own home. And so price, taxes and insurance are a, a big um, issue for me to tackle. I want to make sure that our seniors are able to keep their home and that they're just not leasing the house from the government. I mean, I, I think that the American dream is that. Work hard, we give people the promise that if they work hard and they do the right thing, then we shouldn't be penalized for them. So, so an effort to do that, Increasing the homestead exemption, making sure that those seniors are protected. And look, families that um, that are working two jobs now and raising two or three kids, it's, in, it's incredibly important that we make sure that they're not priced out uh, and that their taxes are kept low because at the end of the day, I believe that families need to keep their, their hard-earned money in their pockets and then in the pockets of the state. You know, government doesn't do too many things very well and, and I think that it's incredibly important that uh, small entrepreneurs, business owners, members of the community are able to have those funds in their pocket to make the economy keep up. That's what keeps the economy moving. That's what looks good. What are your goals there in terms of housing and, and, and you know, low income families? You know, cash out. I, I look at my own children and I say, will they be able to afford right, to buy out. a home in our community the way prices are going? Right. You know, once because you know, if you're in, you're locked in. You've got right. your fixed interest rate. You're in the market. Try it. And, 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 and for existing homeowners, you're okay. But you look at the next generation. Goes, will they be able to, you know, afford? Living in, in, in a community, and I, and I think that uh, the goal there is to, to figure out how how to help our local governments develop smartly to make sure that there are affordable uh, housing options. I'm not talking about low income housing. I'm talking to make sure that there's hubs, right? Because number one, traffic has become a huge issue in Miami Dade, and in order for uh, millennials, younger people, to be able to to function, I think they function best around hubs where you have a work, you know, uh, live environment and they can have affordable housing a lot of them are, are actually good savers there's they're saving up they're working hard and I think that they're very smart but we need to make sure that we provide those options and so working with uh, working with municipalities with the county with developers to make sure that they understand that this community going forward can't just rely on foreign investment because that's what's happening right? you have foreign investment when the economy and real estate tank foreign investment came in and built it out and the result has pushed prices further up and so while there's a, there's a good side to that, there's also the bad side of our price stuff. So I think it's incredibly important. And the other thing is to make sure that we create a climate in our state where people want to bring good paying jobs here. And you do that by keeping a, a low tax base, by, by providing a friendly climate to, to people coming in, and by having good schools. You've got to have high quality options for students because those companies won't come here if we don't have good schools. And I think we do a good job in some sectors with that, but I think there's room for improvement and, and all options need to be on the table to provide those for the students. Excellent. Well, you, you, you talked about education, which is a, a big topic that's uh, been debated here in this, in this race. What's your position on, on charter schools? Talk a little bit about charter schools and, and, and what do you feel about does it give more choice to, to, to parents and what it does for the existing system? So, so look, tar charter schools are, are a tool in the tool belt. There, there's a, the way I look at education today, it's a portfolio of options. And I think my main thrust is that parents need to be in charge. The government doesn't know best how to educate your child. You know best. So I think that we have to have a portfolio of options, whether it's traditional public schools, magnet schools, charter schools, tax credit scholarships. For students with disabilities, we have the Gardner Scholarship now. We even, I passed a reading scholarship. Uh, last year and now parents of kids with that are level one or two have the ability to access that scholarship in the summer to provide enhancements so the kids don't have a learning loss so I think that it's a portfolio approach I'm for magnet schools I'm for charter schools I'm for tax I think parents need to have that uh, that choice so if when, when you and I were growing up it was a neighborhood school and you know our parents got us up in the morning and said you want to school it didn't matter what we thought of the school or if the school was the best option that's where we had to go the world has changed and parents Parents are much more savvy, and we need to empower them because when a, when a parent when a parent has wealth, they, they either buy
buy a new house in a better neighborhood for a better school, or they pay for a private school. But when somebody's living in the middle class or below, why are we exempting them? Why are we removing them the option to pay for a their child? And I think the misconception that any of these options drain money for our public schools, they don't. The key is that the money follows the child. The, the ta we pay those taxes for that child to be educated. We don't pay to keep institutions in business. And so if a school does a bad job and it's, it's critically failing, it needs to be closed. And you know the schools that are performing on it, we need to figure out how to give parents more access to them, regardless of what they do. Right. Now, there, there are kids that will go to, you know, for example, take you know, Miami Springs Middle School here, right. formerly Miami Springs Junior High, right. uh, which you went to Miami Springs Junior, and I think I was in the first class of Miami Springs Middle. You're dating us. Yeah, you? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, that school was the school, let's say my mother went to that school, I went right. to that school, um, and uh, frankly, it's, right now it's rated a, a C school. What kind of options do we have to, you know, let's say here in Miami Springs, to improve a school like that? So, so I think, look, community pressure is incredibly important. I think in a community in Miami Springs where, where I believe the residents have high expectations, the pressure needs to be put on the school by the community to improve. And there are many ways to improve a school. Every community is different, every school is different. You know, leadership is important, the quality of the teachers that you get there are important, but there has to be pressure from outside to say, this school is our community school and we have to make it better, a C is not good enough. And so, uh, there needs to be a deep dive to look at what's gone wrong there, what, what's not being accomplished, and how do we change it. But um, it, engagement is incredibly important. And I know sometimes it's hard for us, because people are involved in their daily lives. Look, I got four kids, and, and you know, I, you get home and you got you got from work, and God knows from you for campaign and, and then you gotta you gotta have time for the kids so it's hard you know to be engaged but I think it's incredibly important that parents engage and demand that the school improves I think we have to demand of our school system that they provide better schools if not there needs to be other options and I think that that's that's where parents in Miami Springs have probably done um, there are some very attractive options around the surrounding community and people choose to take their, their students to a private school or a charter school or, or some or some academy or a magnet school in some cases where, where you can get access to, but it shouldn't be limited to, to a few. It should be it should be available for all all parents to be able to choose what's best for their kid. And look, you know, some parents may say Miami Springs Middle School is just fine and it's serving my kid. That God bless them. That's their choice. I want the parent in charge again to make that decision. Right. right. You know, it's, the world's changed, as you say, and uh, you used to be in this neighborhood where you know it was like, hey, move so so the kids can go to Miami Springs Middle right. House. I, I think. Most of the kids from Miami Springs tend to go to, to, to other schools because there's right. so many options. There are so many options, yeah. which, which did not exist before. Correct. Uh, but from Doral Academy, uh, Matter, Mass, there are a variety of different options that, that kids do go to, as well as the, some of the private institutions from Blessed Trinity and some of the other middle schools in the, in the area. Uh, school safety. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been all over the news, obviously, the school shootings. Um, there are, and frankly, this is one of the things I've seen in some of the, the charter schools where a kid with behavior school with a behavior issue is easily removed. Right. Or, to put it bluntly, they're moved out, they're kicked out right. of, of, of that school. In a system like Miami-Dade County Public Schools, they can't just kick a kid out, per se, they gotta they stay in the system, but at the end of the day, a child that's got some kind of behavior problems needs to be dealt with. If they just ignore it, right. we get a school shooting situation, right? Like, like in, right. in, in Broward. So, to address, address school safety and school behaviors, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, look, I'm very proud that we passed House Bill 726 this year as a result of the tragedy in Parkland, and, and we're providing $400 million investment in securing our schools, school resource officers, especially mental health. But I think that one of the things that, that as a conclusion of the investigation that, that I already knew personally because I spent 20 years in the system is that many of our schools and school systems are afraid to report the facts of what occurs and the data. And I think it's important to take the data head on and say, we're having a problem, there are some behavior issues, we have to address them, whether with mental health or with other options that, that, are, that are available as, you know, as part of their tools. But sweeping it under the rug, um, sweeping it under the rug is what happens is 
unfortunately, you end up with a powder keg, and what happens is we don't ever want to see that happen again, but we have to be honest with ourselves. Look, if incidents occur, we have to report them, and, and they have to be dealt with, and I think that parents in the community respect that more because they know what's going on. It's worse, in my opinion, to have a false sense of security of where you're sending your child to a school thinking, hey, nothing goes on there, and then when you see the underlying facts is really there's a lot going on there, and instead of addressing it, we're sweeping it under a rug. So I think it's incredibly important that we take it head on and that we face, look, some of these issues that we're facing at schools, I know are societal issues. We have a lot of single parent homes. We have a lot of parents that work two, three jobs. And so kids sometimes fall to the wayside when it comes to attention and, and, and verifying what's wrong with them. We need to attack it head on and face that we are, we are seeing those problems. Let's deal with them. Let's not pretend they don't exist so that we don't have a worse problem down the road. Yeah. You know, and I'm just thinking out loud here as, as, as you're discussing this, but yes, you know, one of the things, and I, I don't want to name names, but so my daughter goes to a to, to a charge school and, and she's talking to, to one of her friends who's right. going to, to a different school. And after a year that, that friend transferred to another school and what she advises, their fights at this particular school right. almost daily. And how can that information be better shared so that the public is more aware and not necessarily to it's, it's not to, 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 to blame anybody, but it's, you know, parents should know and be aware of incidents that happen so that they can be addressed. Because, like you said, if they're just swept under the rug, no one knows about it. Right. And then how can you address it? Well, I think it's incredibly important because if the, the parents do have presence at these schools, they have SACS committees or, or parent committees that, that have uh, kind of a leadership role at the school. I think that those parents in that community needs to push to have that information so that everybody's aware and that the community pushes to deal with it. Because the pressure, look, uh, institutions and organizations only react to pressure when it's necessary. And competition makes our schools better. But information and parent engagement, I think, also improves our, our traditional public schools because there's a demand for a certain level of customer service, for a certain level of response, and for a certain level of transparency. And so I think that the best uh, guardians of transparency are, are the parents that are attending and demanding that information. Like I said before, I understand that parents sometimes are just busy with life because that's, how, that's what happens to all of us. But that's the only way for us to, to do that, to demand that of their school board members, to demand that of their principals, to demand that of the people at the region office and make sure, and they should demand it of the charter school they attend the charter school if it's a public school, and they should demand it of their private school. If they go to private school, is their pain go there? So, you know, it, I think that parents are in a strong position to make demands to know what's going on. What's your position on, on the Second Amendment in regards to the state of Florida? Right. And uh, in the wake of the Parkland shootings, and, and, you know, there was a, there were some changes that the governor right. pushed for, uh, and I believe may have passed a, a part of the, uh, some of the new laws. Can you talk about what, what's been done so far and, and kind of your position on the Second Amendment and changes to, to, the, to the way the state of Florida handles uh, gun laws? So I'm, I'm a strong supporter of the, the Second Amendment. I think people have the right to defend themselves. I think law-abiding citizens, uh, that's a right that they have under the Second Amendment to defend themselves. And I think oftentimes what happens is that people forget that because you write laws on paper, criminals don't necessarily, laws aren't written you know, for criminals, they're written for law-abiding citizens. And so we can't blame law-abiding citizens for what other people do. Having said that, I think they took some great steps uh, in 1726 in passing the ability for um, someone who's been mentally incapacitated, someone who's been Baker Acted, or someone who's been, uh, has a uh, history of violence, domestic violence or other, for their, their ability to purchase a gun at that time to be um, frozen. And actually, the court, they have to process, and the court is able to give them their, they, they have their day in court, and they can get their, their ability to get that back. But I think for the moment, especially when you have a person in crisis, it's incredibly important that that person doesn't have access to a weapon. All law-abiding citizens, all Second Amendment uh, defenders are okay with that because everybody agrees that we should not have access to a weapon if you're in a crisis situation or you have a mental situation. So I think that where we got was to give law enforcement the ability to have those checks and balances without infringing on people's Second Amendment rights and, and keeping due process. So, I mean, author, so someone, let's say, is a banker actor, they're, they're acting irrational, right. they're identifying, and they're, they're going through the banker act process. When that happens, their their right to to, right. to purchase a handgun goes away. What happens if they already had pre-existing handguns? Are those removed 
seized or seized at the test, or what happens there? So what? What happens? So there's two steps. Um, number one, if, if you are being corrected or in a crisis situation, it's frozen. It's not. I, you know, I want to make it clear. It doesn't. It doesn't eliminate their Second Amendment rights permanently. What it does is allows them to be frozen for 30 days or extended up to 60 days by a court, and then that person can can petition to get their rights back, and doctors and all the professionals, healthcare professionals, and mental health professionals can come back and and, and validate that they're okay. Second of all, if they do have weapons already, the law enforcement can petition the court for a warrant that would allow them to, to temporarily seize those weapons while the person is in that condition. Once that person is cleared, then they get their, I want to be clear that the person has due process and they get their weapons back, but it averts a situation and we've already had that law uh, implemented several times in Florida. We may have saved lives already because it, I, I do think it is common sense that if you have Again, I, anybody on the spectrum of where, how they feel about the Second Amendment feels they all agree that we don't want people who are either in a violent situation or a mental health situation to be able to have access to weapons. And I think we could have avoided, unfortunately, I think this is one piece of the bill that could have avoided the tragedy in Parkland because we saw that there were 50-something instances where law enforcement or other agencies had the opportunity to step in and they decided not to document it, not to take action, to sweep it under the rug, and we ended up with a powder keg at the end, unfortunately. It's a tragic, sad, very sad situation, it's tragic. I think we have to make sure that that never happens to us again. Let's talk about, switch over to the economy and taxes, uh, which you were alluding to earlier, and, and, and how that impacts small business. Tell us you know, your position on, on taxes moving forward if, if you're there, and, and what you want to do with the tax environment here in the state of Florida. I think that the tax environment of the last 20 years has, has been one that is stable, and we have lowered taxes. And I think that the way, look, a lot of states have made, you think they get desperate, they've made errors. Places like New York and California, and Illinois, you can see that they, they're, they're handing out subsidies to try to keep companies. Florida grows by a thousand people a day and the reason that that happens is because of our low tax environment, because it's friendly to companies to come here, because we have a good education system and companies feel comfortable coming here. I think we need to continue those policies and make sure that the everyday blue collar, regular Joe keeps their low taxes. Now what happens is when you have that environment for a long time, people get complacent and they feel like, oh man, it could be better. I, I, I would say if you guys you know, the, the feel that way, if you go to California or go to New York, New York is, they give you an example, New York is, we passed New York and we're the third largest state uh, by population in the nation. Our state budget, including federal funds, is $87 uh, billion dollars a year. Um, the New York budget is $187 billion a year, and they are uh, smaller than us, right. and they, yet they have more than double the budget. So that gets to show you how frugal Florida has been. Another thing that's been that's, that's good for our environment is that we have eliminated debt. Now, to be clear, we cannot run in a deficit at the state level. We don't print money. But the state can incur debt, and what we've done under the, the last 10 years of leadership is we've been able to, to repay that debt, cut that down, put money in reserves, so much so that now we're, we're rated AAA by Moody's, and you know what that means. That means when you go borrow money for building roads or infrastructure projects or whatever the state needs, that you're paying much less, and ultimately, that, that's saving taxpayer dollars. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not the pocketbooks of the elected officials, it's, it's, it's everybody's collective taxes, and I think that's important, and three national think tanks have already rated Florida number one in the nation in financial health and another one in freedom because economics is a big part of that. If you want to open a small business in Florida, it's a great environment. Now look, we still have work to do. There, there's still regulatory issues at the local level where we hear nightmare depending on the municipality where somebody's trying to open a business and it takes forever to we, we, need, we need to deal with that. I want to be clear, that's not completely solved, but in the grand scheme of things, Florida is doing very well and we can need to continue to go in that direction because what we want is anybody, who, from whether they're 17, 18, or 72, that comes up with an idea and says, you know what, I'm going to launch myself and be an entrepreneur and takes that risk. We want to have them be able to keep their money and reinvest it and that's where employment comes from that's where jobs get created they're not created by government they're created by people uh, like yourself and others who just venture off on yourself reinvest that money and all of a sudden they create uh, employment for other people and the economy continues to spur because that person now has money to go spend at a restaurant like this and, and it's a chain reaction Fantastic. and just officially so everybody knows my ceviche is here in Miami Springs it's a beautiful restaurant that we love and enjoy uh, again, we appreciate it, Manny, for, for joining us. Uh, 
Jobs, the state of Florida has done well when it comes to jobs. Um, I think unemployment rate, the numbers we're going to call today, I think they were rumored to be around 3.8% nationwide. Um, nevertheless, what are some of your plans to, and I know taxes are, are a big part of them, but tell us about um, how you do get the job market going as well as it, it, the competition for jobs and, and, and what a lot of folks want is um, yeah, we're, we're, we're salary starting to go up. Right. right. So, so, so I, no, it's interesting because I've been I've been do, I've been visiting uh, local businesses, both small and larger, uh, from you know Echo Glass in Dundee, which has six hundred thousand square feet. I think they great incredible story. Cuban immigrant was homeless four years ago, and all of a sudden now has this multi million dollar business. Um, to wow. little <laughs> restaurants like like ceviche and you know uh, Jarrah's Burgers here and Listo, all, all these things in Miami Springs. I think that the what happens is. Uh, Low taxes are one component, but another thing that I'm getting from industry is work skills. And so unemployment in Florida is at 3.7%, below the national average. But what's happening is, and we witnessed it ourselves, and I'll explain that in a minute, is you start to to employ everybody that's out in the field, and then you get to the kind of the people that are in that place where they either lack the technical skills or the soft skills. And what's happening is there's no masons, there's no carpenters, there's no air conditioning mechanics, there's no automobile technology. And those are jobs where you start could start out of high school at $25, $30 an hour. So I think a major thrust for us, because this is what we're getting from the business community, is we got to train more skilled workers because we just can't. It's not now we have the inverse going on. We have jobs that we can't fill because we don't have the qualified personnel or trained personnel. And in some of them, they're telling me it's just the soft skills like getting to work on time, going to work every day, you know, working eight hours. I mean, that, that believe it or not, and we saw that because when we when we bring in people to hire them for our campaign work. In the 16th cycle, we had no problem finding extremely qualified people, motivated, and you, know, you could tell they were with it. And as you look for it now, we start you start to run dry after a certain number of people. You know, they're just the people that are out there, and I'm not even talking about them personally, but the fact they come in and say, "Well, you know, I don't really want to work five days a week. I, I, I want to work two. You know, I don't want to work six hours, maybe four. So what tells you though is that they're really not in, in, interested in full employment. They're just kind of a, like almost like a hobby, you know? Right. That that's a clear sign that the unemployment is very low and that you're running out of deficit and what ends up happening is in the economy is that pumps up uh, pay rates that's what ends up paying high paying jobs but the, the, the gap in the link is you have to have the skills and so we need to do a better job of look I want every student to have an opportunity to go to college I think that's incredibly important especially first generation you know uh, but we also have to have opportunities for students that decide they don't want to go to college to be able to get the skills. So there's nothing wrong with being 19 years old and getting a 25, 30 dollar on job with medical insurance and benefits uh, that can that can last you a career. You know the trades, but all of these schools are desperate for skilled workers and they're not getting them. So I think we need to do some some more soul searching when it comes to partnerships between our public schools and the trades and the industry, between our charter schools and the trades or private whatever. It is. Uh, our community college. No, like Miami Lakes Tech was a great school for folks exactly. who are looking for a trade work. They right. learn how to right. work on air conditioning right. units exactly. and welding. And, and, and. Yeah, well, well, some of these, they're actually paying yeah, really well they, right they now. partner with Toyota, and so they have a Toyota certification okay. uh, project uh, that the student leaves there ready to go to work for Toyota. Now, to the here in Miami Street, Baker, the George T. Baker Aviation, where I actually spent six months as an administrator, students leave there with strict FAA uh, certification and they go with the 20, 25 to 40 hours an hour to start. Wow. So I think those are the examples. We need to think outside the box. It's not just, you know, go to college and get a, get a job where you're in an office. It's engineer. Engineer. Or, uh, uh, programmer. Or, uh, programmer. Yeah. Or, you know, carpenter. Yeah. You try to, when's the last time you try to have yourself a piece of furniture made out of wood? Good luck finding a carpenter. So you know what I mean? Those skills are, are, are really in demand and I think that we how do, you, how do we say it? We need to make it cool again to be able to, to have people to say there's no stigma to that, man. If you if you want to be a carpenter or if there's a there's a young lady that wants well, the to be a carpenter, there. the money's there, man. we we, we got to have uh, the ability to get these kids prepared and have them go to the workforce there because they can certainly make it a great, great life uh, in, in the economy of straight to jobs. Perfect. Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier, transportation and the traffic that is South Florida. Um, 
you know, I was commuting here from, from Miami Springs to Brickell and back for, for the last couple of years. And in the morning, getting to Brickell, a piece of cake, generally, and I'm an early bird, so I kind of got to get ahead of the, of the traffic. But in the afternoons, it is just brutal. And I'm going, it's a 15 minute drive that's taking 45 minutes to do just because of the congestion on, on the roads. And I've got an easy drive. My colleagues here coming from Kendall, it's a, you know, a daily two hour fare to and from. There's been, I know uh, Mayor Miami-Dade County uh, just pushed for trying to get its expanded highways and really kind of funded on, on, on rail ex expansion. Talk to me a little bit about where you think the state plays a role in terms of helping places like Miami Springs and Hialeah and, and, and South Florida Absolutely. in terms of transportation and, and how the state can help out with transportation. Well, I, I, look, first of all, I think that uh, infrastructure is one of the main functions. Of this. The state has certain functions and, and infrastructure is one of them. Um, going back to traffic, like when, when me and you started driving probably around this area, yeah. you used to get to Miami Beach in nine minutes, you yeah. used to get out there and there was no traffic. It's, it's a different world. It's, it's the, you know, the good and the bad of living in, in Miami, beautiful Miami, Dade County, right? That people want to live here and then it causes overcrowding. We developed everything out west and, and there was no planning done correctly for the traffic. Um, so I think that the state has a role in trying to supplement what local municipality. Now, in Miami-Dade, there, there is a transit half penny tax that they use correctly. And, and you know, digging into the deep details of that is a much longer conversation. Something I don't have control over, it's local. But I think that that needs to be used properly to make sure that we have the most effective and efficient ways of getting people around. The other thing is I think we have an opportunity with what we spoke about before, which are hubs, right? If you get people to live and work within the same hub, right, then they can walk, they can, they can commute, uh, using other means, uh, a trolley, a bus, etc. Because rail is extremely expensive, and we kind of put the cart before the horse here in Miami Dade because when we were growing and they made the effort of putting the metro rail in there, they really didn't do a good job of having it run in the right areas. Only the southern end works pretty well, and, and obviously the brick area, the metro area, that, that, that works very well. But I think that we have an opportunity now to create some dedicated lanes where maybe we could have some hybrid. Uh, transportation is something that maybe looks like a train, but isn't actually a train and runs on wheels uh, that we've seen in other cities. Um, I think we have to. The other, the other, the other thing we're fighting here is that culturally we we don't we're not used to public transportation. So people in Miami are not used to walking, and they're not used to getting the bus, and so everybody wants to have a car, and so we're fighting against that. And, and then with the new generation coming in, that may change because. Um, they're breaking some of the old habits of Ubers and Uber and Lyft are new phenomenons, you know, those kind of things that are, that are going on. I, mean, um, I think that that's an opportunity for us to invent new technology. But in the meantime, I, need, I, I think we need to take advantage of whatever we have, whether it's a dedicated corridor or whatever it is, to try to provide uh, transportation connections to the hubs. We have a metro rail station west of the, of the Palmetto, not too far from Miami Springs. I think that there, we need to figure out ways to have some lines connect to that so that we have people that are moving north and south. Certainly east and west leaves a lot to be desired, so if there's already a railway there that can be used by the county to provide some kind of east-west transportation. But the key is, with a, if you don't have a place to go when you get off the train or the bus or whatever, then you're really defeating the purpose because people are, people in Miami are not going to walk eight or nine blocks. In New York, if you tell somebody they're walking six or seven blocks, they're fine with it. They're used to it. In Miami, you say that hey, it could be a combination of the heat. That's a, a, that's a big factor. Yeah. And, you know, but, but I think that transportation hubs uh, and, and means have to go somewhere. Right? They just can't run the lines north and south or east and west. They have to go to FIU. They have to go to the Intermodal yeah. Center. They have to go to connect to the metro rail system. And if we do that, I think we have an opportunity. And there's, there's various solutions locally that are that are on on the map. And it, I think the state's role in this is for us as a delegation is to be uh, mindful of that and support it financially when the ideas are brought to us that are, that are, that are actually viable. You know, figuring out what's viable and then fighting for those dollars. Because remember, people look at state politics and they, they think, you know, one party or another, they think this or that. But actually, the biggest fights are regional because of the funds. Miami Dade, if we don't have a good, strong delegation, what, this, what the rest of the state does is they, they, 
they separate us and pick us apart. We're like a donor, a donor for county, right. donor county, donor county, and we don't get back to what we what we what we give because they they figure out a way to pick us apart. So I think it's important for us to put uh, partisan politics aside when it comes to regional funding and make sure that places like Miami Dade. Look, Miami Springs has infrastructure needs. I had conversations with the mayor at length. Uh, with members of the council and with, with the manager, and I know that those those needs vary from year to year. It's important that we put those on the forefront. And having somebody who's who, who's able to know where to go, how to do it, how to, and to leverage leverage influence and be able to bring those dollars back to the community. Right. That's one of the most important things that you can do as a state legislator. Policy is policy, and you have those arguments or statewide policies, but leveraging those dollars back to your community are the most important thing that we can do uh, in making sure that those tax dollars that are spent here uh, stay here. off back and stay here. And then there's it's not automatic. No. It's not automatic. So, so having a strong delegation and strong members who know their way around, uh, you know, Tallahassee's not Washington, it's not broken. We pass a budget every year. Uh, the government doesn't come to a blind. People's services continue. But the money's going to go somewhere. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's like the, the Super Bowl fight every second to see who gets the money. Mini, is there anything specific to the Miami Springs audience that you want to share with them and, and as part of your story? Well, look, the, the fact that I, that I grew up uh, in this community, going to, since, I, since I was in uh, seventh grade, I was uh, coming into Miami Springs, uh, all of my friends were in Miami Springs. I had family that actually lived in, in Miami Springs uh, during that time, going and spending uh, a large portion of my life, especially during high school, from ninth grade to twelfth grade. And, at the campus, we had involved in baseball and, uh, and other activities. It was a year-round thing. It was it was not a you know it was not a seven thirty to two thirty thing. It was a seven thirty to seven thirty thing. And so, really understanding that Miami Springs is a close community, that the, the residents have a certain expectation of quality of life, and, and be, being able to uh, understand those needs and represent the community that wants that. Because look, all of the communities in this county are different. Within this, within the Senate district, there's difference in the community to different uh, priorities, but after being able to, to reach back to, to friends that still live here, uh, or have moved back here, uh, really my friends over, uh, over at the River City Gazette who covered me when I was a baseball player in high school, is still around, and you know, being able to, to tap into those resources to really understand the, the needs of the community and the fabric of this community growing up, uh, you know, participating in the Fourth of July parade, which is traditional in other places in the country, but the you don't see it a lot in Dade County, but you see it in Miami Springs. So it's, it's heartwarming to do that and, and to understand uh, the needs of the community. So I, I would be blessed to be able to to, to represent the, the town where I kind of grew up and, and you know learned a lot of lessons as a high school student. Last question, May. Why should Miami Springs and Beachy residents vote for you? Because I understand the community and I'm ready to fight for the needs of this community. Uh, it's just it, you can't have somebody from the outside who's never stepped foot in something. I always I always find it interesting when you have uh, politicians that, are, that show up to a community that never knew anything about it, took no interest in it, and then all of a sudden uh, pop up and want votes. I mean, I had a, I went to high school here, I had a business here, I have many friends here, and, and to me it's always been important uh, to come back. In fact, one of the, the thrilling things to me is to see the development of the circles. I always had a thought, this place has so much potential, you know, and now you have all these great restaurants like Ceviche and the others around here, and a Starbucks, I mean, it's great to see this. So I'm excited about uh, representing this area. So what we do, many will want to thank you on behalf of Mike Street. And then Mike Street Audience for joining us. Thank you. And uh, wish you the best of luck. Uh, again, we're, we're here at beautiful ceviche, so you can enjoy Come on down and get some fresh ceviche. Fantastic. <laughs> hey, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.